professor for Bio 319. And I'm going to be giving um, the next the penultimate lecture of the semester. Um, it happens to be 30. It'll be 30 minutes long, almost. Perhaps a little bit more. Um, it's two lectures, really, rolled into one. Um, so here's your outline. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about over the, the next 30 or so minutes. This table right here, definitely handy. And by the way, I'm going to make it worth your while to, take, to watch this video. Um, there are a bunch of questions here that you could study, and um, I can tell you the answers now. In animals, sex is always genetically determined. False. Definitely false. Um, which of the following sources of genetic variability are found in sexual but not asexual animals? Ooh, this is a good one. Sexual but not asexual animals. Um, I'm not going to tell you the answer to that one. But I will say that's one part. And that's about it, actually. Although it's possible in some asexual animals this is happening too. Um, if we're talking about bacteria, then this one, this one, and that one are true. Mutations are happening in no, no matter what kind of sexual system you have. Um, and isogamy is a type of gonochristic. Okay, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> All these phrases. And isogamy is um, eggs and sperm are different sizes. Gonochristic has to do with <clears throat> females and males being in different individuals. So the answer is no. It doesn't make sense. Um, that's the B. Which of the following is likely to be true of protogenous hermaphrodites? Um, protogenous, what the heck does that mean? Pro Prodes first, gynies, vagina, vagina, so female first. Um, males are larger than females, if that's the case. Um, individuals are born as females, female first. And male success is correlated with body size. So A, B, and D are the correct answers on that one. And then this is a land egg. So we call this the amniotic egg. You've heard this before. Choose all that help to explain the designation. Shells impermeable to water movement, but permeable to gas. That's true. Embryo is nourished by internally derived nutrients. That's true. That's true. Um, ooh, this is a good one. D. All animals that lay amniotic eggs do so on land. The answer, as far as I know, and I did a little digging around on this one, the answer is true. Um, even turtles, or marine turtles, they come to land to, re to reproduce. So, there you go. Sex or no sex? Um, that's the first topic. Okay, we're moving into lecture material. Um, different approaches to sex. There's asexual reproduction. And we're talking about animals here. We're not talking about um, bacteria. So asexual reproduction is not the same thing as binary fission that happens in bacteria. And that's a good test question. You might ask yourself why, and we'll see that in a moment. And then there's sexual reproduction, which involves either two individuals of different sexes or hermaphrodites that are either simultaneously male and female or sequentially male then female or female then male. This would be female first, and this would be male first. So those are the types of sex, um, sexual systems that we will talk about in the next few slides. Um, this one is a good slide. This is heavy, a lot of, lot of stuff in it. I'm not going to spend two minutes on it. I'm going to say only one thing. <clears throat> two things. One, know it. Know the content on the left, especially. Um, know these different kinds of um, parthenogenic modes of reproduction. The second thing is there, there are good questions here. So, um, like for example, hmm, which one do bees practice? Which one of these is actually haploid diploid reproduction? Um, one of these is 
two of them, really, are what the bees do. And we'll talk about bees in a few moments. And then there's another question, which goes back to earlier when I said, so how does genetic variability get created in sexually reproducing systems? Well, in sexually reproducing systems, you have meiosis, right? And you have meiosis, meiosis here, meiosis there. Ooh, you don't have meiosis here, right? So you don't have independent assortment, which you have here. So this one, apomixis, is one that doesn't generate a genetic variability like the others do. Um, and then there's also random fertilization, which this doesn't do. This is producing an exact clone. In some respects, this is like binary fission, but binary fission is parent gives rise to two daughters. Um, in animal asexual reproduction, parent doesn't split in two to give rise to two daughters, right? Okay, so there you go. Why sex? <clears throat> this is a good test question. Just remember to use it, right? I mean, I'd ask you, what, there are, most animals are sexually reproducing, um, but asexual reproduction seems like it's such an advantageous mode of reproduction for females especially. It's like, why the heck share your genes with the opposite sex? And one of the main reasons is this, genetic variability. And then I would ask, well, what does that matter? Like, why does genetic variability matter? And I'm going to have you go because of fitness. And then you're going to fill in the blanks. Um, so now we're going to talk about sexual systems that involve actually um, two different sexes. And again, there's um, separate sexes, which is going to Christic. And in animals, and in really plants too, um, there's anisogamy. So anisogamy is that the gametes are of different sizes, and that difference, those different sizes are representations of um, the different levels of investment that the males and females um, generate for the act of reproduction. In fact, <clears throat> test question right here. Um, it has, been, it has said that sperm is cheap, um, and that, of course, would be relative to eggs. Um, females invest more energy than males do in reproduction. What evidence is there to support this, right? Why should the female be the choosy sex and males not be very choosy? Okay, um, so... There's also hermaphroditism, and as I said, there's simultaneous hermaphrodites, and there are some fish, um, like this one is a relative of the groupers, and then this one here is a bluehead wrasse, and you actually have seen a question, I think, or will see a question related to this <clears throat> bluehead wrasse. I think you didn't actually see it last week. Um, this is male second, right, female first, and then this one is a clownfish, and it's male. This is supposed to be portrait. Okay, change that. Pro protandress. Um, supposed to be male first. And it's like, if you, ever, you saw Nemo, all of you did, right? It's like, Nemo's dad was actually eventually going to be Nemo's mother. Um, but they didn't talk about that in the movie. You kind of probably understand why. Um, anyways, so um, why do I have this here? Uh, probably for a good reason at one point, but not today. Um, so here's my question for you to think about. There, there, are, there are actually many levels of questions here um, about hermaphroditism. There's what are called proximate cause questions, like how does it happen? And then there are ultimate cause questions, why does it happen? And why is a fitness question. So why would males become females? And why would females become males? And there is evidence illustrated in these two graphs that helps us understand that. And I am just going to, I'm just like, you guys are adult college kids. I'm going to let you figure out why these two graphs help us answer these two questions and expect the test question on it. I will entertain your answers beforehand. Um, you can float some ideas by me, but I'm going to leave it alone. Here's another illustration of why female then male, or why male then female. Um, and I'm going to 
say it this way. It's like if you're if your fitness of a male is constant through life, and if you're a female and your fitness increases through life, then you're going to have higher fitness as a male relative to females when the male is small. And for female, you're going to have your highest fitness when you're large. So there's selection in favor of male first, then female. But in this case, um, in this kind of a species, males only reproduce if they are harem holders so larger males are better off than smaller males at getting access to females and therefore there's a really sharp um, change in fitness with body size in males and there's still the same effect of body size on fitness in females but in this case it's better to be a female when you're small because you at least will get some reproductive success. And it's better to be a male when you're big because you're going to hold harems and you'll have a chance to reproduce with many females. This is a good graph. These are two good graphs. You want to remember them. Be able to tell a story about them. Okay, now we move on to another topic, which is something that you probably don't really hear too much about when you talk about sex and animals and and that's sex determination. And remarkably, sex determination in animals is really quite fascinating. Um, it's not so simple as, well, there's genetically determined sex. Um, in, in mammals, <clears throat> here's a mammal, um, that's genetic de determination of sex. Um, males are um, heterogametic. Females are homogametic. But if you look at a bird, like it's the opposite, right? The birds, the males are um, homozygous and the females are heterozygous. Um, and lizards and in fish and in frogs, there's like both. It's not so simple as to say that mammals are like everything else or birds are like birds. It's like they're halfway between birds and mammals. And you can even see this um, in other groups being different as well. So there's the first thing about sex determination that you absolutely must know, and that is there's the genetically determined sex, or genetic sex determination, which is often abbreviated as GSD. Um, and these are some of the patterns that you could expect to find in genetically um, determined sexes in different animals. But there's also environmental determination, environmental sex determination, and there are a lot of factors of the environment that can trigger um, changes in or determination of sex, um, temperature of the water, and usually this is something you see in aquatic systems, um, pH, oxygen, density, density of population, salinity of the um, water, the environment that the animals are living in. And these are just some illustrations, like here's incubation temperature, um, sex ratio, and this turtle um, I'm pretty sure yes. This is all males. They're like they're born all males at low temperatures, and at higher temperatures they become all females. Um, here's another one where it's the other way around. It's like high, lower temperatures they're mostly females, and at higher temperatures they're mostly males. Now there are two things, just like there was with um, hermaphroditism. There are two things, two kinds of questions you have to ask. One is it's like, well, how does this happen? And then the other one is, why does it happen? Um, so I'm trying to, I'll try to answer, at least with respect to temperature, um, how it happens. This is the mechanistic proximate cause approach. And then there's the why, which is a, a fitness and evolutionary um, um, ultimate cause approach. So here's just an, an illustration. Um, so we have temperatures, um, as a factor in this example. Um, so low aromatase activity, um, undifferentiated gonad. What does that mean? What is aromatase? Aromatase is a chemical that converts, and you might remember this, I think we talked about it. Aromatase is a chemical that converts testosterone into estrogens. So when the temperature is high, um, you get um, a, high, a high aromatase activity which then leads to um, the production of ovaries. And in this example, at low temperatures, um, 
there's low aromatase activity, and therefore very little of that testosterone is converted into estrogens, and as a consequence, testosterone is produced by the, that or, organism in the development of its gonads. So temperature will affect aromatase activity, which will affect hormones, which will affect development. That's the how. Now on the why, it's like, why would the animals be, like in the case of the fish, they start out females and they be, and the development, they're all, almost all females born. And then at the end of the incubation period, they become more males. And that's, there's a model it's called the Charnoff bull model for fitness. And what it, you'll see, you've seen this model before, but it's not applied the same way. Um, in this case, the female's fitness is going to be tied to size, which of course it always is. Male's fitness is not tied to size. So if an animal, like this fish here, this is a silver side, um, breeds at the end of its first year, which it does, like which, which sex should be born first? Which sex should have the longer growing season? It's the females because there's a, an effect of body size on reproductive success in females. So females are born first because then they have a longer growing season. They can get to larger sizes. And then the males are born later. They don't, it doesn't matter how big a male is. It can be small or large. You can have the same reproductive success. So that's an explanation for an evolutionary explanation for the origins of um, environmental sex determination in this fish. This is just an example. But but I like it because it's a way of thinking about how does this happen? How do these fat, these chemicals in their body, how do the temperatures of the environment affect development? And why do animals do this? So remember, proximate cause and ultimate cause. And now we're moving on to um, totally different subjects. Um, and well, actually not totally, it's related because it's about sex determination. And so we talked about environmental sex determination and genetic sex determination. Here's another one. It's about who you mate with, um, if you mate at all. It's like the type of mating system. So sex determined by the behavior of the male or female, what am I saying, the queen. So the male is produced from haploid gametes, no sex. Go back to that um, slide early on here that I asked you to think about which one of those is haplodiploid. So males are a product of females having um, gametes that are unfertilized that develop into offspring. Whereas in the case of females being born, it's a female mating with another male, the male's haploid, the offspring are diploid, they're, they're all females. So in bees, um, the females are diploid, males are haploid, hence haplodiploid. And uh, my question for you as we leave this is, like, how closely related are brothers? How about sisters? How about brothers and sisters? I love this question. So you're going to see it on the exam for sure. Um, and you're, you can definitely see this. I think you've seen this on a quiz or a homework or matter, maybe not. Maybe not yet. Um, oh, yeah, you have seen this. It's on the quiz for a week. Um, so th what, they would, what is this thing? This is a, a, a diagram that illustrates the pattern of sex determination um, and parthenogenesis and hermaphroditism in animals um, across the spectrum from invertebrates to vertebrates. And so what you want to look at are the letters, first of all, just as an example. We'll start with like A. A is over here. So what is A telling us? What is, what is the story about A? Well, A, um, in all of the the amphibians listed here, um, they're all X, Y, Z, Z, W. That is to say, there, there's sex determination that is genetic, and there are no parthenogenic or hermaphroditic species of amphibians. Um, and that's pretty interesting. Um, there's no haplodiploid species, and there's no environmental sex determination in amphibians. How about birds? Birds are B, right? Birds are all red, and I think red is ZW. So blue is XY, 
ZW is red, and I think that's those are the only two colors. C is reptiles. Reptiles are kind of more interesting, right? C, there, like, there's some that are XY, there's some that are ZW, there's some that are environmental sex determination, there are no hermaphrodites, or no haplodiploids, and no parthenogenic or hermaphroditic species listed. Although, that's not true. There are some species of parthenogenic lizards. Um, that's kind of interesting. But there's they're not that common, so maybe that's why they're omitted. Um, fish, fish are E, fish are the most interesting, fish of everything, like X, Y, Z, W, there are some that are environmental sex determination, actually there are none that are haplodiploid, and then there are a lot that are parthenogenic and hermaphroditic. And then this one, I think, um, G is, like, G is almost all of this, right? It's like the entire, like, three quarters of the circle, um, and those are hexapods. Hexapods are insects, right? And so insects are the most interesting. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. That's thanks. And what am I saying thanks for? Okay. There you go. Um, moving on. Fertilization. Um, external fertilization. Internal fertilization. There are insects that are in, in, internal fertilization. Chickens are internal fertilization. Mammals, internal fertilization. Reptiles, internal. Sharks, internal. There are some species that have to be internal. And it's like... Why? Why does a chicken have to have internal fertilization? Because they lay hard-shelled eggs, that's why. And you lay a chicken egg and you decide to have sperm cover that chicken egg when the shell's on it, forget about getting that fertilized. So the fertilization has to take place before the egg shell is made. That's true for a lizard. Insects have a hard uh, um, egg as well. That has to happen internally. And then sharks, um, there's a really interesting story about why sharks do this. And I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you that, um, for the most part, sharks have internal fertilization and internal development. Um, so the embryos are developing inside the body, kind of like a, a placenta. They have uterus with eggs, um, embryos attached to the walls of the, the parent's uterus. But it's more about um, a very strange way of... Um, osmoregulation that it helps us understand the origins or the maintenance of um, internal fertilization and internal development in sharks. But that's for another day. All right, now development, right? I just said that. So there's internal development, there's external development. Internal development, um, internal development, sorry, has, of course, chicken eggs, mammals inside the body. Um, this is called ovipary, O-V-I-P-A-R-Y, and this is called vivipary, V I V Y V I V A P V I V I P A R Y um, live birth and um, egg born and then there are the external fertilizers with these eggs that are membranous um, they develop outside the in the water column um, they do not do well on land right so who fish frogs and uh, and almost all in aquatic invertebrates um, and then internal development um, either inside of an egg hard to say why am I saying internal development internal development inside the body so the mammals have internal development sharks have internal development and there are some fish that have internal development other than sharks um, and what else not many others and yeah, that's pretty much it so internal development is inside the body mammals sharks a few other fish and to external development is you know, a hard hard shell or um, not a shell external in water external on land all right that's it I think that's clear now okay so here we have a table we're building we got a lot of information on it um, that's built off of what I just shared with you over the last 17 slides um, and we'll continue um, I'm going to talk about mating systems, parental care, and sexual dimorphism. This is about um, behaviors. And I think this would probably have been a natural stop for a first lecture, which probably went way too long. Um, anyways, I want to talk about mating systems. This is about choices that um, individuals make. And there are three that I want to emphasize. One, well, really four. Um, promiscuity means no mating systems. A lot of aquatic animals are like this. Um, pair bonding, where you have a mate for life, one male, one female. 
and then multiple partners, polygyny and polyandry. Poly meaning many, gyny meaning females, polyandry is many, and andry is males, so many males. Poly polygyny is most common, um, and this has to do with sexual selection, females being choosier than males. Um, polygyny is males being chosen by females, the males that have certain qualities, um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, mating systems continuing. Uh, what do I want to say? I don't think I want to spend a lot of time on this one. Um, polygyny type. I, I don't even think, I'm, again, I cut this down. It was like, don't worry about this one. Um, but this one I do want you to think about. So I talked about polygyny as being more common than polyandry and really is more common than monogamy. Um, there are some animals that have practiced monogamy, like birds, for example, um, but polygyny is more commonplace. So this is big, bigamy is another way of thinking about it. Um, and so the, there's something to model. This is a why question, right? It's like, why would females choose another male that's already got a female with, uh, with him? Why would the female do that? Um, and the answer is um, represented here. So what you have is um, fitness curves as a function of territory quality. And so this is uh, assume territory quality increases in this direction and that um, fitness of the female offspring will increase um, as ter territory quality increases um, and for the monogamous female um, she will always have for any given territory she will always have um, better offspring fitness when she's mating with the male alone than when she's having to mate, share the male with some other female. But the reality is this. Um, in, a, in a complex world, like think about a bird in a marsh, like the red-winged blackbird. Males are out there building territories. And there are some males that have really good territories. And there are some other males that have really lousy territories. The female comes in, the first female that comes in um, will choose a territory. So she'll choose, let's say, this really high quality territory. And so there will be not, no male there, or no female. So the female's, first female's fitness will be like here. And now imagine another female comes in and she has a choice. She chooses a male with a poor, um, territory potentially, or she chooses a male that's already been mated and has um, a fitness, has chooses the male that's already been mated and, ha and will give her offspring this fitness. So she will choose that male that's already been mated when the fitness of her offspring is above this threshold here. Right, that's the threshold, polygyny threshold. So, if the female's other choice has the territory quality down here, then she's not going to choose this male. She's going to choose this male. But if there's an, an unmated male out there that has ter territory quality where the fitness of the offspring would be up here, then she's going to choose the unmated male. So, the decision about whether to, to be monogamous or polygynous. For the female um, is about the quality of the territory of the parent male, which will then affect the fitness of the offspring that is generated from the pairing of those two. Okay, hopefully that's acceptable. Um, this is beautiful. I love this one, but I, it's like this is the last week. We're done on that. We're done on this. Um, uh, I want to cover this one. Yeah, I like this one. Okay, so let's talk about parental care. This, this is a story here. I like this one because there's a good story. The story is manageable. I mean, these other ones here have good stories too, but this one's like at the end of the semester, this is a good story for you to kind of digest and think about. 
Um, so parental care is, is um, not terribly common in invertebrates, but it is um, among insects. It certainly is social insects, but not among a lot of other invertebrates. Um, but in, in the in the vertebrates, we can see parental care of various forms. So I have questions. Um, when do animals practice parental care? What are the costs of parental care? And who provides the care? And um, so one way to think about it is illustrated here. Um, who provides the care? It's like, what species? Well, as it turns out in um, the easiest one, birds, both males and females provide care. And you might want to think about why. Why would that be the case, right? It's like, I'm not going, going to tell you. You should be able to figure that out. You should like, you pay attention to birds. And then you should also figure it out, like, why is that the case in mammals that it's mostly females? The story gets interesting when you look at fish and amphibians. And amphibians, males are more commonly um, providing care. So here's male parental care and fish. This is male parental care and amphibians. Males provide the care. This is the story that's the most interesting one to try to understand. This one is kind of easy to figure out. Like, why is it both? This one is even easier to figure out, I hope. Um, the fish and the amphibian one is a little harder. So to answer the question, like, why do females provide care in one case and males in another case, and the two still in another case, um, you have to think about costs and benefits. Um, so here's the way to think about it. Um, the benefits, benefits are true for both. Like it increases fitness um, for both sexes equally. The, neither one is investing um, any more genes in the offspring. So the, the um, fitness benefits are equal for the two. But costs of care, um, females invest a lot more energy, up to four times more energy in um, reproduction and the mass of eggs, for example. So this is a female-only cost. Um, cost of care, if you're an internally developing species, uh, that falls on the female principally. There are some exceptions, right, like the seahorse or the kangaroos, I think, actually, no, kangaroos, but seahorse males actually hold the offspring. Um, but of course, in most species, this internal devel internal development is linked to females, and then reproductive success linked to body size, but not equal for both sexes. Um, current reproduction imposes cost of future reproduction. This is a good one. This is this is for both males and females. So here's I'll give you a hint. The answer to the question: um, Why in fish is it that males are um, why in fish and male and amphibians? Why is it the males? Are providing care more commonly than the females. It has to do with the male being able to reduce this cost. The female cannot. And I want you to think about that's such a great question. I will give you a hint. It has to go all the way back to here to help you answer it. Okay, moving on to the next and last topic of this lecture, um, sexual dimorphism. So sexual dimorphism <clears throat> is um, what it suggests, right? It has to do with sex, and di has to do with two, and morphism has to do with morphology. And so, as we all know, I'm sure, um, animals tend to have males looking different than females. Males bigger than females, females bigger than males. Males more colorful than females. Males more obnoxiously loud than females. Um, this is very common. Sexual dimorphism is true for all sorts of animals, insects, and um, other invertebrates, and all sorts of um, vertebrates. And I want to just say that that's a fact. And then the question is, why is that a fact, right? Mammals are larger section than many species, yet and females are larger section than that and many others. Like, why does that happen? Well, I will tell you this. There are two, there are two possible explanations um, about sexual dimorphism, and they're kind of summarized here. 
Sexual selection is um, the mechanism, which is the mode of natural selection, where members of one biological sex chooses mates of the other sex to mate with, that's intersexual selection, and compete with members of the same sex for access to members of the opposite sex, which is intrasexual selection. Um, Darwin distinguished sexual selection from natural selection. That's a good question for a, an evolution class. Um, I'm not going to ask it on this test. Uh, but I am going to ask about intrasexual and intersexual selection. When we think about size, we think about sexual dimorphism and body size, males being larger than females, that's males competing with each other for access to females. That's intrasexual selection is selecting for large body sizes in males. Um, ornaments in males are likewise being selected for by, um, uh, as a result of combat like antlers, horns, um, other, other features that are associated with combat. Um, females are being selected for um, always for large body because reproductive success is correlated with body size. Um, it's, just, it's when females are larger than males, it's when there's not strong selection for large male body size. And that's an example of or illustrates that males are not beating each other up to get access to females and those kinds of species. So that's intrasexual selection, right? Um, and then there's the features of the male that the female is attracted to, which is intrasexual selection. And oftentimes that could be size, but more often you're probably thinking about colors and, um, and the architecture of the male, like a peacock, if you think about a peacock. Like a female is choosing attributes of the male that are going to be attractive to her. Now, of course, it's not attractive in an emotional sense. It's attractive in a fitness sense. So there's got to be some um, fitness basis for the coloration differences that exist among males. More colorful males are going to be more fit. Females select for the fitter males. That's for another class. Um, but that's an example of intersexual selection. Okay, I think that is it with this being the last slide. Um, just remember that I am not going, going back to some of these slides, I'm not going to ask you to think about and, and uh, spend any time thinking about conditional strategies or alternate mating strategies. Um, I'm not going to ask you to think about female uh, defense polygyny or resource defense polygyny. Um, and I think that's it. I think everything else is fair game. All right. Thanks. Bye.